Leonardo da Vinci is widely considered to be one of the greatest painters who ever lived. But besides creating masterpieces like the Mona Lisa, he had an enormous curiosity for the world around him. In his lifetime, he made impacts in fields as different from one another as architecture, weapons design, human anatomy, and civil engineering. He also left behind 13,000 notebook pages, and they were jam-packed with writing and drawings and plans for inventions. 13,000 pages. Leonardo da Vinci was an artist and a scientist and many things in between. In Leonardo da Vinci's time, the arts and sciences were not considered to be the polar opposites that we consider them to be today. Today we say that artists are right brain dominant thinkers and they navigate the world with intuition, creativity, and emotion. And we say that scientists navigate the world in a left brain dominant way, and that they are logical and analytical. So two separate worlds, art and science, and they're populated by two groups of people that think very differently from one another. But is this always true? And are there any artist-scientist hybrids alive today, or did they all disappear at the end of the Renaissance period of Leonardo da Vinci's time? And why should I care about any of this? Well, this is my first published piece of artwork. It is a drawing entitled, A Car. And this is scanned from the newspaper. I made this drawing when I was four years old, and I've pretty much been an artist at heart since somebody first handed me a crayon. And I've pretty much been drawing and making things ever since. But I also always loved science. And my mother, my amazing mother, saw this in me. And she signed me up for a microbiology class for kids when I was six years old. And in this class, we looked at drops of pond water under microscopes. And honestly, this was one of the most formative experiences of my life. So I looked in this microscope, and I saw these beautiful green things gracefully moving around. And I saw these little balls, and they were spinning around manically, almost as if they were driven by motors. I've felt the pull of the worlds of both science and art my entire life, starting with that realization at the microscope that there are these tiny invisible worlds around us. But when I was about ready to dip my toes into adult life, I decided that I would study biology because I reasoned it would be easier to work as a scientist and do art as a hobby, as opposed to try to do the opposite. And I dug very deeply into the life of science. I eventually got a PhD in molecular biology and worked in multiple research labs across the country, including five years in the biology department at MIT, and I was a postdoctoral research fellow there. During the years that I was there, there were three Nobel laureates on the faculty of that department, so it was an incredible place to be doing science. But during the years that I worked as a scientist, I never lost touch with my creative side, and I continued to draw and make things. And I also began to collect stories of creative people working at this intersection of art and science. And today, I'm going to share with you the work of a handful of artists who are doing incredible work in this realm. Zoe Keller is an artist who makes work about vanishing and threatened ecosystems. And she feels that she needs to truly understand the things that she draws. So she researches them like a scientist. If Zoe were going to make a drawing of a specific location, she may spend months reading books about the location. She may enter into collaborations with scientists, and then eventually she goes to the place itself to sketch and take photographs. Zoe carried out in-depth research like this in order to create this pencil drawing of a threatened ecosystem off the coast of California. And this drawing is incredible. It is seven and a half feet wide, and it includes more than 60 species. If any of us were to be lucky enough to stand in front of this drawing in real life and spend some time with it, this big, beautiful, complicated drawing, I think we would be able to truly understand the complexity and diversity of nature. Because Zoe doesn't just include the big animals and the flashy plants. She includes things that we might not ever even see if we went to that location, and things that we sometimes forget about. 
things like nocturnal animals, insects that pollinate the plants, and the earthworms that aerate the soil. Zoe's work reminds us of our dependence on our connections to the living things around us. Adrienne Siegel is a sculptor out of San Francisco, and she makes art out of scientific data. I'm gonna walk you through my favorite piece of Adrienne sculpture, and it's a gorgeous furniture-like piece, and we're gonna read it like a graph. So the horizontal of this piece represents time of day, and it's a 24-hour period. And the vertical of this piece is the height of the ocean level, and this is in San Francisco Bay. Each one of these metal bars in the depth represents a day in the course of a month. So here's what the data looked like that Adrian made the sculpture from. And this is what tidal data would normally be shown to us as. But here are some things that I can understand from looking at Adrian's sculpture and sort of understand them in my gut that I don't think I would understand nearly as well if I just looked at the graph. I can see that high tide happens at different times of day over the course of a month. And I can see that high tide is higher on some days and lower on other days over the course of a month. But what's most interesting to me, and something I think I would really miss from looking at the graph, is I can see these subtle patterns that the ocean carries out. So Adrienne Siegel makes art out of scientific data, and she presents it in new formats, in ways that we can understand and interpret, in ways that make sense to us. And she does this again and again with her work. She takes data sets from events in nature, and she turns them into this exquisite but understandable sculpture. The next two artists I'm gonna talk about took things that they saw in nature and then experimented with them extensively and ended up with extremely novel work. So this sculptural piece is on the scale of jewelry. It's only about an inch and a half in width. And it's a part of a series of art that has been exhibited all around the world. And it's the result of a collaboration between the French artist Hubert Duprat and some very interesting collaborators, caddisflies. Caddisflies are closely related to butterflies, and when they are larvae, they live in streams and other freshwater environments. And they create rigid cases around their bodies, tube-shaped cases, and they make them for protection and for camouflage, and also as a place where they can undergo metamorphosis. And they make these out of things that they find in their environment, things like rocks and sticks and bits of shells. So Hubert Duprat was hanging out in France near a stream, and he was hanging out with his friend who was panning for gold. And Hubert wondered if a caddisfly had ever incorporated a piece of gold that was just traveling downstream into its case. And this single idea sent him down this pathway, and he's been creating art in this series for decades. So what Hubert did was he set up tanks in his artist studio. And he experimented until he was able to get caddisflies to create their cases. And then he replaced the rocks and the sticks and bits of shells with gold and precious gems. He even figured out how to get the caddisflies to create stripes and patterns that he designed into these cases. So together, they create these strange, beautiful, tiny sculptures. And Hubert said that he feels that his role in this is that of an architect, whereas the caddisflies are the builders who are carrying out his plans. Berno Smilda is a Dutch artist, and like many of us, he is inspired by the beauty of clouds. But when he tried to paint them in his studio, he was frustrated with his results. So he began to wonder if he could make an actual cloud. So he studied how clouds were made in nature, and he started experimenting, playing around in his studio. He got to the point where he could create his own clouds, and now he travels around the world creating clouds in man-made environments. This is one of Bernot's clouds, and this is in a Gothic cathedral in Germany. So this is a cloud. This is a three-dimensional water vapor-based cloud. So Bernot, he brings his cloud-making materials into a location, and he can do some shaping and kind of move the cloud around with his body. But these clouds only exist for five or 10 seconds. So when he's happy, he'll step out of the way and have the cloud professionally photographed. 
He then uses Photoshop to remove his cloud making equipment from the final image. In order to come up with a final image that he's happy with, Bernos may spend several days in a specific location, and he may make hundreds of these clouds. I find this series of work absolutely magical. I think it's just that we've only ever seen clouds just sort of wild and free in nature, and there's something so fascinating to me about seeing them in these man-made environments. So if we were to see an image of one of Berno's clouds in a museum, or maybe one of Hubert's tiny jeweled caddis fly cases, the work looks effortless. But can you imagine the amount of experimentation and failure after failure they must have gone through in order to get to this point? Rob Kessler is an artist out of London, and he works in a variety of artistic media. But I have this soft spot for one series of his work, where he uses electron microscopy to illuminate parts of the life cycle of plants. He told me that he also had a parent who introduced him to a microscope when he was just a kid. And we both share this passion for these tiny, magical worlds. So this is what a, this, a standard image from an electron microscope would look like. It's sort of, uh, it appears to be like a topographical map, and it is a black and white image. So Rob entered into a collaboration with the Kew Botanical Gardens in England. And he's using electron microscopy to study these tiny seeds, pollen grains, and fruits for the, from the botanical collection. Now, what Rob does that's different from a standard electron microscopist is one he's using his artist eye to orient the specimen in the scope, to, to make it look beautiful to begin with. And then he's also digitally stitching together sometimes hundreds of microscope fields worth of data in order to create an image like this. And then he also chooses colors, which he layers on in a very beautiful, organic way. So Rob's work was the hardest for me to choose just three or four images from. And that is because his work is so stunning, and also he has made hundreds and hundreds of these images. But also, the structures and strategies that plants use in order to propagate themselves, meaning to make baby plants, is also spectacular in its own way. So each of these tiny seeds and pollen grains and fruits, they are tiny, exquisite sculptures made in nature but we can only see them through the artwork of Rob Kessler. And the last artist I'm going to talk about today is me, Kristen Levere. So 17 years after I first started working in a research lab, I decided to transition from the life of a successful scientific researcher to the life of an artist. So I left the world of science for the world of art, which had always been my other great love. I have been an, a, a studio artist for 13 years now, and when I first started in this new career, my artist's resume, it had my name at the top, and it was completely blank otherwise. And now I've exhibited work in more than 40 galleries, museums, and contemporary art fairs in places like LA, Chicago, and Miami. But when I started this new life, I honestly had no intention of bringing my scientific background into my art. But looking back on it now, it seems obvious that my biggest inspirations would come from the worlds of science and nature, which I'd always loved so much. One series of my work is focused on the concept in nature of protection, particularly maternal protection of the young. I also make a lot of work focused on plants. Um, I adore plants, and I spent several years researching them in the lab. But the biggest inspiration for my work comes from motion. I love things that are propelled by wind and water in their environment. So I'm a huge fan of tentacles and flagella and leaves blowing in the wind. I'm a wood sculptor, so I work with this rigid material, but I have this obsession with sawing and carving and bending the wood into these sculptures that appear to be in organic motion in their environment. And I think this all goes back to that microbiology class that I took. I think that I'm trying to replicate that beautiful undulating motion that I first saw when I was six years old under that microscope. What I'm trying to do with my work overall is I'm trying to create sculpture that's at this intersection of art and science to remind us of the complex, breathtaking spectacle of the natural world. And I feel like I'm doing exactly what I was meant to do. 
I am so thankful for the generosity of the talented artists who allowed me to talk about their work today. To me, these are people who are using both sides of their brains. And their work shows so powerfully the amazing things that can come when people trust their intuition and their own vision, and when they just choose to ignore these artificial barriers that are put up in the world. And they are doing this by researching and by experimenting in their studios and by persevering through failure after failure in order to get to that initial vision or idea that they had. And they are doing this propelled by curiosity and by passion for their work. And many artists I know do the same. And you know who else does that? The best scientists. I've had my feet planted firmly in both the worlds of art and science. And I can tell you that those two worlds are not nearly as different as many people will tell you that they are. And if you have something inside of you, something you feel passionate about, I wish for you the courage to get it out, share it with the world, even if you have to break a few rules and defy a few categories to do it. Thank you.